I have responded to over 1,000 different comments and questions about the full saw drive beta button, and today we're going to talk about the top 10 questions that I've gotten. First, let me qualify myself by saying I am not an expert. I am not in any way tied to Tesla. All my answers and observations are based upon all the conversations that I've had and the research that I have done. So this is as known by Cody. Next, remember that this safety score is that. It's a safety score. It was designed for the insurance side, not for the beta. So remember as we go through these questions that this is designed for an insurance company looking at something from a risk standpoint, not to qualify you to be inside of a beta program. This is a metric being used by the autopilot team to gauge who should be a part of their beta but i would very highly suspect that post beta we will not have this as a part of the program to qualify to be a part of the full self drive program in fact i would be completely shocked if this had anything to do with full self drive post this beta stuff and with elon coming out just recently saying that the people with the highest safety score will get the rollout first 1000 at a time of course we all want to get that elusive 100 score but with the way this was actually designed with an insurance score just getting a high score is good it's not all about getting 100 it's just about being a safe and good driver i would say anything 85 and up is going to be really good giving you excellent rates on this in terms of how the program is actually built and with an 85 or higher score and remember this is just my opinion you're going to get really really good rates but i know we all want to know how to get that 100 score because we want to get first in line to get the beta so that's really what we're focusing on right now because that's really what my channel is you know covering all right well this first First one is more of a case study and it came from a guy named Ruben that I met on Twitter and Ruben sent me his situation so let's take a look at it and by the way check out this nice garage that Ruben put together isn't that awesome so when I give an example the last three trips I got with my car I've got a 60% rating on the unsafe following so the last trip I did today I drove about 25 miles all together the trip two miles were not on autopilot and 23 miles were on autopilot and um, I'm trying to understand that 60% uh, unsafe following because on a highway on autopilot, I set up my following distance to five and then I move it to six, but I still get a 60%. So I'm trying to understand exactly how they calculate. Is it 60% of the two miles I drove without the autopilot that is unsafe following? Or what is the 60%? So this is what I try to understand. I'm still at 99% uh, score, but I'd like to bring it up to 100. Okay, so basically what happened is he drove 25 miles. He got a 60% unsafe following distance, yet he still got a score of 99 overall on the drive. And only two of those 25 miles were not on autopilot. So his score was saying that he spent 60 miles on that drive at an unsafe following distance. Yet again, he still got a 99% on that drive. So how does that work? First, we always got to break down the rules. The first rule is that you only calculate your following distance when you're not on autopilot. That's the first thing. The second thing is that it only calculates when you're going over 50 miles an hour. So there's a few ways that this might have happened. First off, it had to happen in that window of two miles that he was not driving an autopilot. And second of all, it had to happen again when he's over 50 miles per hour. So if you got 60% that said that he was following too close, a lot of things could have happened there. Let's just say that maybe half of a mile of those two miles, he was actually over 50 miles per hour. So out of the entire 25 miles, only half of it even qualified to be dinged for this. And so out of that 0.5 of a mile, half of a mile, 60% of that, he was too close to another vehicle. Well, then you're going to get a 60% score on that drive because out of your entire 25 mile drive, two miles of that, you are not an autopilot. And only 0.5 miles of that were you even over 50 miles an hour. And out of that, 60% of the time, you're too close to another vehicle. So it makes it look like the overall drive, you had a bad score, but the reality was, it was barely even affected you. It just looked bad on the app, but overall, you're totally fine. But this can happen in lots of other ways, because I'm assuming a little bit here where he actually was being on the freeway. You think of it this way. You could be going down like a 45 mile an hour or main arterial, where you're following all the cars, you're going together, and you're maybe pretty close to the car in front of you, but it doesn't really matter because you're not being affected by it yet. But then all of a sudden, everyone else speeds up, and you're not on autopilot, you're in the city, let's say. Okay, so everyone speeds up, and now you're going over 50 miles per hour, but maybe just for like two minutes. Well, out of those two minutes, let's say you hit the brake, or maybe you got too close to the car in front of you in those two minutes for like maybe one of the two minutes, and all of a sudden you got a 50% score for following too close distance. Well, yeah, because out of your entire drive, those very few minutes qualified in the category to being even tracked. And out of those two minutes, half the time, even though it was hardly any time, you were too close to the car in front of you, and that's why it looks that way. So what Ruben could have done here if he didn't like the fact that he had that 60% there is he could have just gone and driven another, you know, 10, 15 miles 
while not on autopilot over 50 miles per hour. And then that would have diluted that down to something extremely low. But as an insurance company, you don't really want people driving more and more, but in terms of the beta and what we're using this for right now, that's one way to get rid of that. Next up, does autopilot affect your safety score? The answer to this is yes, it does affect your safety score, just not negatively. You will get credit for all the miles that you drove, however, you will not get dinged for braking or being too close to other vehicles. Let's take a look back at the case study with Ruben. Of the 25 miles he drove, only two of them were not on autopilot. But because he got credit for all 25 miles in terms of actual driving distance, that 60% he got that was too close when he wasn't on autopilot barely even affected his score. He still got a 99. If that didn't count, his score would have been a lot lower. So yes, driving on autopilot counts your miles. It does not count anything that happens when the car is in control. That'd be like Tesla saying, don't trust our vehicles and don't trust our autopilot. That would never happen. They can't say that. Number three, if I use regenerative braking only, will that still trigger a heavy brake ding on my score? The answer to this is yes, it absolutely can. As it should, and here's why. These cars are one pedal driving. You letting go off that accelerator is equivalent to you pressing down on the brake pedal. It is designed to be one pedal. You have complete control of how fast you pull your foot off of that accelerator. So if you're doing it too fast, you're being too aggressive with how fast you just let off of that thing, well, you're gonna expect a ding, just as if you were to push on the brake too hard. Now, some of you aren't really gonna like this next thing I'm gonna say, but it's true because we're talking about an insurance calculator. If you live in a city like LA or Seattle here, and you're using regenerative braking in the city, you're not on autopilot, but people are cutting into your lane. You're being a good driver, you're leaving lots of space like you should, but then people just cut in, and you have to hit the brake really hard, and you're getting dinged for that. Well, you've gotta remember something you're in a spot where you are at higher risk. It's an insurance calculator, it's an insurance score. If you're constantly having people cut in front of you or you're hitting your brake, you, because you're at a higher risk, you're gonna need to pay more premiums. That's the way insurance works, that's normal, you should expect that. That's not something new, that's not something Tesla is doing uniquely, it's just that they're being very open about how they're scoring you. Whereas someone else who lives in a rural area where barely sees any cars on the road, no one's cutting in front of them, well, they're at a lot lower risk so they shouldn't be paying as much as the guy who has a much higher chance of getting hit by someone darting in front of them constantly. But yes, if you're in a city and you got cars cutting in front of you all the time, you're using regenerative braking, but you're always hitting that brake, maybe it's pedestrians all of a sudden cutting you know, at lot stoplights or something when you're trying to gradually come in, you're at a higher risk. You're at a higher risk of doing damage, you're at a higher risk of receiving damage, you're gonna get hit on your score a lot more, and that's the way it should be. That's just the way it is. Next, let's talk about those unpredictable things that you're driving, you're fully alert, you're very aware, and maybe a squirrel or a deer or a person darts out in front of you on the road all of a sudden, you hit your brakes real hard. Now, a lot of people, a ton of people have made comments about this because they're like, well, I'm being penalized for being alert and a responsible driver. And I totally get that, but here's the thing. Let's say you go out on a drive and you're going to work and back, maybe it's 25 miles and this happens to you say one time and you go down to like a 97 or 96, 95 even. Well, right now you're looking at that like, oh crap, that squirrel just really made me look really bad. But in terms of the insurance score, that's still a very high number. It's not a problem. It's absolutely not a problem in terms of your, ins in terms of your insurance score. So you won't care. You're only caring because it's affecting and because it's tied to the beta. But they can't do anything to correct that. I mean, how would you fix that? Now, if you're getting squirrels darting in front of you every 10 feet, well, now you're in a high risk area. You're being dominated by squirrels. In fact, you should probably call someone. And if that is the case, yeah, you should be paying more because you're getting overrun by squirrels and that's super dangerous. You live in a dangerous area and you need to pay more for that protection. Now, this next one is another case study and I've heard this from quite a few different subscribers, okay? And so what they're saying is they feel like the system is pretty flawed and here's why. And I, and I do understand this one. And I'm gonna read a direct comment from someone that just posted on my last poll. They said, you are penalized for people cutting you off in traffic by hard break and follow distance, but you can run stop lights, stop signs with no problem. He said he did run a red light just because he didn't want to get a ding on his score for stopping too quickly. Someone said he ran the light, which didn't have a penalty. So now there's a lot to unpack there, but I want to just focus on one area of this, and that is that it's okay to run a stop light or stop sign, but it's not okay to stop for a pedestrian or squirrel. Obviously there are some issues there, and there's a few things that, that have to be said. First of all, don't run stoplights and stop signs. That's never okay. I mean, if we're leaving lots of distance between us and we know lights turn yellow and then turn red, we know stop signs require us to stop, 
most of the time we should be able to stop in time without there being any issues. And the few times that that's not the case, well, it should be a very small part of a very big drive and you should be fine regardless. But that all being said, that is an issue and Tesla does have the ability to see stop signs and stop lights. So I would assume if it was me betting on this that in future updates of this that we will see them actually take that into account to where if you do run a stop light, or a stop sign, you do get dinged for that. But no, as of right now, if you run a stop light or stop sign, you do not get dinged for it. But we certainly do not want to recommend anybody runs one of them just to not get a ding on their safety score. Now I want to take a minute and thank everyone who has subscribed to the channel. I've set a goal of hitting 30,000 subscribers by the end of the year. We are less than 100 away. In fact, less than 90 away from hitting that right now. Now I also know that 80% of my viewers, 84% of my viewers are not subscribed to my channel. So if you're not subscribed, help me out. Go down there, it takes no effort on your part. Hit subscribe, follow this video, hit the like button if you've learned something today. Let me know that I should keep making videos like this and helping you guys out. That would be so much appreciated. All right, next question. Even though your app shows which profile is actually logged into the car at the time, the overall score is of the car itself. So all people driving the car will contribute to the overall score of the car. What you need to remember is that this is an insurance company, which in this case is Tesla, that is insuring the car itself. So because of that, it is a car rating. Wherever that car goes, whatever that car does, is what the risk of that car is. And so that's what's insuring. It doesn't really matter who's driving it. But maybe this is a good time to actually talk about the scoring system and really how it all works. So there are two scores. You have your daily score, which you see when you click on that little button at the bottom of the home page there, the daily. And then you have the overall score, which is that great big score on top. So now your daily score is just all of your drives accumulated for that specific day and all your different ratings. And it's just all there for that day. But that big number that we're all focused on on the main homepage, what that is is an average of all the weighted miles that you've driven all together. So what do I mean by weighted mileage? So let's say you went out today and you drove 10 miles and you got a score of 80. And then tomorrow you go out to the grocery store two miles down the road and you get a score of 100. Well, that's gonna barely impact you because you've got 10 miles at a score of 80 and only two miles at a score of 100. So that's what weighted is saying. So let's say you take two weeks then, and over two weeks you're getting 75 to 80 on your score. And all of a sudden you say, well shoot, I want to get my score up to 95 or 100. Well, you've got a lot of miles logged at that lower score. So you're going to need to spend a lot of time and a lot of miles at 100 or close to it to actually bring that score back up. And right now, when we don't have a lot of miles log, because we only have this for a short period of time, it's fairly easy to increase that score because we don't have a lot of miles of it being low. But if you have a bunch of miles and days and weeks of it being low, it's gonna take a lot more high scores to get it up. You're not gonna be able to just go out, get a couple of drives at 100, and have it make much difference on your score because it's weighted by the miles you've driven. Next up, does Smart Summon affect the score or is it just like autopilot or adaptive cruise control? Now I couldn't find any specific information on this, but I would have to say that it falls in the exact same category as autopilot and adaptive cruise control. And I say that because it falls in that same category that Tesla provided these things to you and for them to say, yeah, use them, however, they're not safe enough to where we're not gonna ding you on them if they mess up, which means very weird. It just would not be something Tesla would do. It would make them look very bad. So I would say if you're using Summon that you don't have to worry because even though it's stopping a lot and whatever, it's still being controlled by a Tesla system and it's not you in the car doing it and you're gonna be just fine. Now this next one is kind of beating a dead horse again, but we're gonna talk about adaptive cruise control and can you get dinged while using it? Not autopilot or auto steer, just adaptive cruise control. And the answer to that is no, you cannot get dinged for it in terms of stopping, people cutting you off, you know, following distances. It's all still being controlled by Tesla, just like Summon, just like Autopilot. But I do want to warn you here because this is something where people get themselves in trouble. Let's say you're driving an Autopilot or you're driving an adaptive cruise control. And of course, I don't know what kind of buffers there are for after it's like terminated by you or disengaged. But if you were to like, let's say someone cuts you off and you kind of panic and hit the brake real hard rather than just letting Tesla stop you, you hit it yourself. Well, you disengage that and now you just hit the brake super hard, which means technically that should count as a hard brake. I'm assuming that that is the case. So you wanna be really careful of that if that happens. Let the car stop you if you're able. If not, do whatever you're gonna feel safest at and you know, screw everything else. But I'm pretty sure that there's something to be worried about right there. And again, maybe there's a thing where 
you know, there's a few seconds that they give you in case that in that situation, but until that's verified, just be really careful about that. Okay, second question. Maybe you've enrolled into the program, but for some reason you can't get access to the app. Or maybe you have the app, but you can't get the latest version. Or maybe you have an Android phone and you simply don't have it yet. The question is, am I still being scored? And the answer is absolutely 100% yes. Just because you can't see it on your app, if you've hit enrolled, you are absolutely being scored. Here's how we know this. I've gotten reports from multiple people who've been driving for two, three days on this already. And what's happened is they've went and got maybe an old buddy's old iPad or they bought an old iPhone or something and logged into it just so that they could see their score. And they've had a score that's been tallied for three to four days now. So if you've enrolled, drive like you're enrolled. Drive like you're being scored every single time because you are. And no, I don't have any updates as to when Android and Canada and anywhere else are going to be actually getting this program. It's hard to find information on that unless a tweet randomly comes out. But I have gotten told by quite a few people in this poll right here that they actually do have it on their Android phone. So some phones do have it, but I don't have an Android. I have no idea about how they did that. So maybe if you do have it on your Android phone, please comment down below that you do have it and confirm that and that these aren't just people messing with us. And last, there's been a ton of people who have made comments about how when they're pulling into a parking garage or in their garage at home, that they're getting dings all over it and they're being hit against a score because of proximity to things as they're pulling into their garage. This is an absolute myth, no you're not. The dings you're hearing are just your parking sensors, your proximity sensors yelling at you that you're close to things. It does not affect the score. Why? Because of the rules. You're under 50 miles an hour, which means that if you're under 50 miles an hour, no proximity to anything matters. Yes, you could get a hard brake, I guess, if you came screeching in your garage and slammed on your brakes, but you're probably not doing that. And there's a few other things I want to point out here as well, that when we're talking about cornering and how fast you're cornering, remember that this is a side to side speed that they're giving us, not how fast you're going around the corner. It's how much the car moves in speed side to side around the corner. So when we're talking about cornering is talking about left to right, side to side. So where you're going to get in trouble with this is the really sharp corners where you feel the G force is shifting like this side to side and you're doing that quickly. If you're going at normal speed, you always do around corners and you're accelerating faster than the 8.9 miles per hour you're allowed, you're going to be fine unless you're doing it in a tight corner. I mean, you should not be staring at your speedometer here, in other words, and checking it because it's not, it's not going to be displayed there. Now, if you had a sharp corner and you're going at high speeds, that's when you're going to get dinged for this. So hopefully you guys know a little bit more than you did 10, 15 minutes ago, however long this video ended up being. If so, please leave a like down below in the comments and do one thing for me. Let me know how many miles you've driven now and what your current score is. Thanks for following along. Looking forward to all getting full self-drive soon and see you on the next one.